A young man, 29 years old, named Edward Snowden, leaked documents that reveal espionage and surveillance operations carried out by the U.S. National Security Agency. Snowden was not an outsider. He worked for this agency. He was one of them. So this man is a reliable source. The documents he leaked revealed a dangerous secret about security and digital espionage. What we are going to talk about today is one of the most dangerous topics. This video is not about conspiracy theories. It is about real proven facts. The devices that are in our hands help these people monitor us through them without knowing, taking advantage of our cameras and microphones. Snowden's leaks revealed that the U.S. National Security Agency has the ability to monitor the entire Internet. Everything you write or upload to the Internet is stored. Every word, every image, every video, even the things in your email or your private conversations. Once again, we are not talking about conspiracy theories. These are real, proven things. And this is what we are going to see in today's story. On December 1, 2012, this man, Glenn Greenwald, received an anonymous email. But before talking about what was in that email, let us first know who Glenn Greenwald is. He is a known American journalist. He used to write articles for Britain's Guardian newspaper, one of the most famous and oldest newspapers in the world. Greenwald was one of the journalists who are known for their defense of freedom. He was always supporting free journalism and also defending WikiLeaks. As previously mentioned, Glenn Greenwald received an email from an unknown person on December 1, 2012. This person claimed that he worked for the CIA and the NSA and stated that he held sensitive information that he wanted to share with him. At first, Greenwald was very interested, but after he began emailing that unknown person, the latter forced him to go through many complicated security procedures. The goal was to protect their discussions by encrypting them. It was clear that this guy was a technical expert, but Greenwald started getting tired of those complicated procedures. He felt that the guy was exaggerating and just wasting his time. He even suspected that he may be trying to trap him, so he gave up communication with him. A month later, in January 2013, this lady, whose name is Laura Poitras, also received an anonymous email. Laura was an American director and documentary producer. Her name was on the list of American security agencies because she produced many movies about the U.S. invasion of Iraq, Guantanamo prison, and many other things that exposed the American government. Laura used to be constantly detained and interrogated, although she was a journalist and the American Constitution grants freedom of expression. Even though she was American, each time she wanted to enter the U.S., they used to stop her, search her, and cause her a lot of trouble and obstacles. Laura and Greenwald were actually friends. They had a solid relationship because they had a lot of things in common. They were both journalists. Both of them called for freedom and stood against U.S. government practices. So the anonymous person who was contacting Greenwald, when the latter stopped answering him, apparently tried to reach out to Laura. Citizen 4 was the name used by the anonymous person, and it is also the name of the documentary that Laura released then. The message sent by the anonymous person contained a method to encrypt the communication between them, making it difficult to track. This means that Citizen 4 assumed that they were monitored. After they had set a way of communicating, they started an encrypted conversation. The anonymous person was trying to make Laura believe that she was actually monitored, and she had to be careful with everything and everyone around her. They kept in touch for a long time and exchanged several messages with each other. Briefly, this anonymous person had been telling Laura that the NSA was monitoring almost everything. He told her that after the 9-11's attacks, the NSA and CIA had frighteningly expanded their surveillance and espionage programs, and they began intercepting and storing the data of most of the intelligence that passes either through the telecommunications network or the Internet. This man was talking about the many pieces of information and data that are intercepted, saved, and stored in huge databases. And this wasn't limited to hostile and foreign countries. Even the Americans' communications and data were monitored. 
He also stated that telecommunications and technology companies are taking advantage of their clients' trust and privacy to an unimaginable extent. The communication between Laura and that anonymous person lasted for several months. After that, having given Laura a general overview of the evidence and documents he had, they decided to meet each other in April 2013. They agreed that the meeting would take place in Hong Kong, in the lobby of a hotel named The Mira. This was the hotel where the anonymous person had been staying. Of course, the meeting had to take place outside of America in a neutral place, so the anonymous person chose Hong Kong. Then he asked Laura to tell Greenwald about the meeting. He knew that they were friends, and he told her that he tried to reach out to him first, but Greenwald cut contact with him for some reason. He asked her to go to Greenwald and see if there was any chance that he could accompany her to the meeting. Indeed, Laura went to Greenwald and told him everything about that guy. She managed to convince him that the anonymous person wouldn't waste their time. On the contrary, all she heard from him proved that the matter was way bigger than anything they were working on. Greenwald and Laura took the plane and headed to Hong Kong for a face-to-face -face meeting with the anonymous person. The latter told Laura that he would be holding a Rubik's cube so she could recognize him, and both had agreed before on a passcode so they could confirm the identity of each other. The passcode was that she had to ask him when the restaurant would open, and he would reply, I don't know, ask the reception. Greenwald and Laura went to the hotel and waited for him in the hotel lobby. They thought that the man that they were about to meet would be an old person maybe in his forties or fifties. They assumed that the man, who has all the powers to have access to the strongest security systems in America, would be old and a man with experience. But they were surprised when they met a 29-year-old young man. Greenwald and Laura went up with him to his room, where they would get to know him. His name is Edward Snowden, the man who will reveal the secrets of the greatest and most dangerous monitoring and espionage operation in the 21st century. Before delving into the details, let us first know Snowden's story and how he reached this place. Snowden was born on June 21, 1983, in a family with a long military history. His grandfather was an admiral in the army, and his father worked in the Coast Guard for 30 years of his life. Unfortunately, his family started to disintegrate due to disputes between his parents, which ultimately led to their separation. This caused Snowden to lose interest in his studies, even though he was a very intelligent child. Due to these family circumstances, the Snowden family moved, and because of the move, Snowden missed school for nine months. Instead of returning to school, he took the GED test, which is the test students take after graduating from high school. Despite not completing his formal education, he excelled in the test, meaning that he didn't even have a school diploma. Snowden discovered his love and passion for technology and programming, so he began taking courses in computer sciences. He started learning and developing his skills on his own. This way, he was able to reach a high level in that field just by auto-learning without getting any academic diploma. Keep in mind that Snowden, until now, had no diploma. Years passed, and Snowden became 22 years old. Despite his intelligence and all the skills he acquired in computer sciences and technology, he didn't manage to get a job because he had no diploma. So, he remained unemployed for a period, until he decided to join the army in 2004. He decided to follow in his father's and grandfather's footsteps. However, his journey in the army didn't last long. A few months after his joining, he suffered a leg fracture while descending from the bed. After this incident, he was no longer able to continue his military service, so he was discharged and became unemployed again for a period, until 2005. In this year, Snowden got a job at the Maryland Center for Advanced Study of Language. He worked as a guard. He wasn't a professor or an employee, due to the fact that he had no diploma. Bear in mind that the center was supported by the NSA. At that time, the NSA was looking for skilled people in technology and wasn't interested in someone like Snowden, who had no diploma. However, after the 9-11 attacks, 
they expanded their surveillance and espionage programs. So, they were looking for anyone who had technical and programming skills and could help them. So, at that time, Snowden managed to apply for a job at the CIA. They were surprised that he was achieving the highest grades on their tests, even though he didn't even have a degree from school. So, they did interviews and additional tests and felt that this person had high capabilities, and maybe if they trained him, he could become a very valuable person. That's why they sent Snowden to one of their training centers. And there, even Snowden's professors were surprised. When they give him a task or training that is designed to be solved in a certain way, Snowden surprises them and solves it in a different and more effective way. Meaning he creates a new way of thinking that they themselves didn't expect or think about. He used to solve the problem in a measured amount of time. For example, if they give him eight hours to work, they are surprised that he solves it in less than an hour. So, they immediately realize that this person is a genius and that he would do great things in this field. After a period of training, Snowden became officially an employee of the CIA, and he became a network expert. In 2007, they sent him to Geneva, Switzerland. Geneva is a well-known city where the world's headquarters exist, the UN, the World Health Organization, the Human Rights Organization, and many others. So it is considered an important city internationally. The CIA had a strong intelligence network in Geneva. So Snowden, as an, a network expert, was sent to this city to help secure the CIA network. Snowden, in this period of his life, considered himself a patriot who had so much love for the country. As I said, he was raised in a military family, and he saw that his country is the greatest country in the world and that the people who work in the military and intelligence sectors are the heroes who protect this great country. Or is this what he used to believe at the time? But during his time working with the CIA in Geneva, he began to discover the dark side of the American intelligence system. Snowden states that there was a man who worked in the banking sector in Switzerland, a man who had a high position and important information for the CIA. So the CIA agents got him to drink alcohol and prompted him to drive his car drunk so that the police would arrest him while driving, which is a big crime. And this is exactly what happened. The police arrested him drunk. But the CIA offered him that they would drop this charge on the condition that he cooperate with them and become their informant. Eventually, the man accepted. This was one of the situations that made Snowden feel nervous. He began to see the work of the intelligence agencies on its true side, and he began to realize that it is completely different from what he used to imagine. This is not a work of heroes. There was direct cooperation between the NSA and the CIA. It is normal for two agencies like these to be in direct cooperation. So Snowden, who was a tech expert working with the CIA, used to sometimes receive tech experts from the NSA to exchange some information. So, during his work with them on some joint missions, Snowden began to discover the NSA's abilities in surveillance and espionage. Snowden, at that time, was introduced for the first time to a program called PRISM, a program run by the NSA. Its task is to collect data and information that passes through the big American tech companies, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and all the other big and well-known tech companies, besides telecommunications companies like Verizon, AT&T, and many others. So their program is designed to intercept and collect all the data that passes through these companies, including emails, conversations, pictures, and videos. They have everything. We are not talking about a conspiracy theory. These are facts proven by Snowden's leaks. Snowden's leaks revealed that these big tech companies have secret contracts with the NSA, and the NSA pays them billions to monitor their servers all the time. They should remain silent and not speak a word. Everyone should know that all that is uploaded to the internet is actually stored and monitored. Even the most complex encryption system can be broken and hacked, and thanks to their program, they may gain access to all the messages, emails, and calls. Everyone has to assume that he is being recorded and stored. The NSA keeps everything. 
The amount of data and information they collect is huge, and if they want to know anything about a specific person, they can get it with a single click. They can get everything, even the things that people think are hidden and private. But let's assume that they don't have a specific person in mind. They have a specific event in a specific area. For example, they want to know the people who hate the American president in a city. Here comes the role of another program that Snowden revealed. It's called X-Keyscore. This program is a search engine where you can write certain words and define some of the filters. You can write the name of the American president and you can write the word attack or explosion. You can define this search in a specific area and the program will search in its huge database and show you the results as if you were searching on Google. But the difference is that it searches emails, messages, and private people's calls. This way, they can find people who are considered potential threats before carrying out any attack. Snowden had been working for the CIA for two years, since 2007, then resigned in 2009, but he did not go far from the field of intelligence. He then started working for the NSA. He did not work with them as an official employee. He worked with them as a contract worker through Dell. The NSA likes this move. They prefer the employees who work with them to look like they are working for other companies so that they can work with the NSA secretly. Snowden worked with them as an engineer and systems manager. He was one of the technicians, which granted him all the powers you can imagine. He had access to all the systems and spyware and knew all its secrets. What Snowden saw at that time was really insane. The NSA was monitoring the whole world, even the allied countries. They were exploiting the networks of communications and the internet all over the world. Snowden mentioned countries like Japan, Germany, Austria, Brazil, and Mexico. All these countries were considered allies of America. However, they were spying on them at all levels. They were monitoring all their communications and networks. Not only that, Snowden stated that they had planted bad software in these countries' networks, meaning they planted it in the electricity network, water network, and main services. This bad software is currently disabled, but if one of these countries in the future changed its position towards America, they would then activate this bad software with a simple press of a button and destroy all the infrastructure of the country. Keep in mind that we are talking about the allied countries to America. We are not talking about the enemies like China, Russia, and Iran. Snowden also said that one of their missions was to follow the world leaders in different countries. They were following their movements and their own private things, and they were trying to catch their scandals so that America would have the upper hand in any negotiations. So don't be surprised when a country leader or a senior official obeys America immediately. America uses malicious methods in its negotiations, such as scandals. According to Snowden, the NSA has the power to hack laptops and phones, and they can turn on the cameras and microphones from a distance. Snowden himself always covers the cameras on any device he uses, laptops and phones, because he knows that these cameras could be hacked and turned on from a distance. He himself did it when he was working with them. He used to monitor people, and he himself admitted this. Snowden saw insane things during his work with the NSA. He was trying to convince himself that the system would be fixed on its own. And for all these things that are happening and mistakes, there are senior people who will pay attention to them and fix them. This is what he thought, but nothing was fixed. Even Obama, who was the President of the United States at the time, broke all his promises concerning this matter. He said in his election campaign that he would stop all intelligence and security violations of citizens' privacy. But nothing has changed. Spying and surveillance operations have continued. Snowden started to feel confused. He felt like he had to do something about that, especially after he realized that most of these spying operations were on American citizens themselves. The NSA used to collect data from their citizens more than any other country. Snowden started to consider exposing what was happening as a national duty. One of the things that prompted him to make a decision on this was the congressional meeting with General Keith Alexander, who was at the time the director of the NSA. In 2012, the Congress invited General Keith Alexander, the director of the NSA, 
to attend a meeting and explain to them some of the things that the American people are afraid of. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. All of his answers were no, no, no. The director of the NSA is lying to the Congress, which is the legislative authority in the country. So Snowden felt that things were getting more and more serious. If the NSA is ready to lie to the Congress, then what is left? Snowden decided that this was a national duty and decided to reveal the secrets and expose the NSA. He then began, little by little, collecting files and documents and leaking them outside the NSA building on small flash drives. Of course, most of the employees who work at the NSA are forbidden to take flash drives with them or any storage equipment outside the building, and they are always searched at their entrance and exit. But Snowden, being a technical person and a systems manager, had specific powers. One of them was that he could take in storage devices and flash drives and take them out of the building. So he kept collecting these important files for a while. And after that, at the beginning of 2013, he started reaching out to the journalists, as we said at the beginning of the video. And imagine that Snowden didn't tell anyone about what he was planning to do. He didn't tell his father, his family, or even his girlfriend. He didn't tell anyone at all so that they wouldn't get involved. Now let's go back to what happened in Hong Kong. After Snowden met with the journalist Greenwald and the documentary director Laura in the hotel, they went up to the room where Snowden was staying, and there, the first thing they did was that they started getting to know him. Where are you from? Where did you work? What are your proofs? What kind of documents do you have? Of course, Laura, the documentary director, filmed all of the meetings, and you can watch her documentary, Citizen 4, if you want all the details. This meeting was long. It lasted for eight days. So, what are the most important things that happened during these eight days that they spent in the hotel room? In the beginning, Snowden introduced himself and explained that his goal of the leak was that he wanted the whole spying and surveillance that the NSA is doing to be revealed to people, especially American citizens. The Americans must know that their government is spying on them and that all of their privacy is taken away and all of their data is stored. The second thing is that Snowden told them that he doesn't want them to protect his identity. He doesn't want them to consider him an unknown source. No, he wants these leaks to be in his own name. The goal wasn't fame, but the goal was to protect his family and colleagues. And he even said that after he took the files, he left behind digital traces that revealed his identity. So once the NSA starts investigating, they will know his identity. They will know that he is the one who leaked the files. Snowden told the journalists that he wanted all the blame to be on him because he was eventually the one who leaked the files and he was ready to assume his responsibility and bear the follow-up. But at the same time, Snowden said that he doesn't want the focus to be on him. He wants the focus to be on the files he has. The story is these files that confirm the existence of a complete espionage operation on all of the world's population. Besides Greenwald and Laura, another journalist from The Guardian, the same newspaper that Greenwald worked for, joined the meeting. Snowden opened the files he had and started showing them and explaining many of the things we have mentioned, including the PRISM program, the X-Key score program, and the special search engines of the NSA. He explained many things in detail, and one of the scary things Snowden talked about, for example, was that the NSA has 20 devices called TOMLOTs. Each device can monitor a billion calls and internet sessions at the same time, and each device can collect data at 125 gigabytes per second. And since there are 20 of these devices, it means that they can monitor 20 billion calls and internet sessions at the same time, and they can collect data at 2.5 terabytes per second. All these statistics go back to 2011. Snowden said that these devices are updated every year, 
and this was about 13 years ago. So imagine the updated versions of those devices they have today. The journalists looked stunned while listening to Snowden. They couldn't believe what they had heard. Snowden used to tell them that this was not scientific fiction. This was real and is happening now. And these technologies are developing rapidly. He told them that all the information he had and was showing them was already considered old. Snowden told the journalists that he did not want to be responsible for publishing these documents. He would provide them with the documents, and it was up to them to determine what was suitable for publishing and what was not. As previously mentioned, Snowden and the journalists spent eight days in that hotel. During these days, the first journalistic report was published. They didn't want to publish all the leaked documents at once, so the first report they published was about Verizon, the well-known American telecommunications company. The report shows how this company cooperates with the NSA and allows them to collect all the records of calls from their customers. The report that came out after that was more powerful. It was talking about a program called PRISM, the program used by the NSA to cooperate with the biggest American technology companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, and others. The report explained that the NSA has the right to access all the information that is on the central servers of these companies. Of course, this news spread like wildfire. During their stay in the hotel, the journalists shot a video of Snowden. In this video, Snowden talked about his work in the NSA and the leaked documents he had. This was the first video to reveal Snowden's personality in front of the world, and of course the video spread everywhere. The American government could not deny the matter or claim that Snowden is a liar, but they tried to show that the whole thing is less important and that Snowden is exaggerating. They also claimed that all the processes used to collect this data were encrypted. No one can access them unless there is a specific goal, and there must be a judicial warrant for these processes, attempting to make people believe that all of what Snowden revealed was legal. The American government tried to cover the matter, and at the same time, it began to focus more on Snowden, to distract people from the content of the leaks and documents, so they considered Snowden a traitor and a spy, and they wanted him to be judged under the federal spy law, which is called the Espionage Act. This law is dedicated to people who are considered high-ranking traitors who leaked the secrets of the state during the war. Imagine that this law has only been used nine times in the last 100 years, and one of these nine was Snowden. The strange thing is that this law was supposed to be made for wartime, but Snowden was considered a special case. Although what Snowden did was supposed to be a scandal, it was not espionage. Regardless, the American community was divided into two groups. Many Americans, especially politicians, considered Snowden a traitor, while others considered him a hero. Anyway, Snowden has become a wanted person. After appearing in the video, he became known to the whole world. Snowden was nervous at the time, but he was ready for anything. He knew that there was a high probability that he would be arrested. What happened next was that a lawyer specializing in human rights came to the hotel and helped Snowden reach out to the United Nations. Snowden managed to apply for asylum through the United Nations. During this period, Snowden disappeared. The lawyer who helped him took him to a small community that was living in poor neighborhoods in Hong Kong, and these people hid him. The lawyer told Snowden that these people are poor people without citizenship, and they are also waiting for asylum through the United Nations. And the lawyer himself was working on their cases, so he had nothing to worry about. During this period, the U.S. was asking Hong Kong to extradite Snowden. But Hong Kong did not respond immediately. They were a bit hesitant, so Snowden was able to move freely. He was not being followed by the Hong Kong authorities. But of course, the CIA workers were already looking for him, so he had to remain vigilant. Anyway, Snowden was able to communicate with people who work at WikiLeaks, who helped him get political asylum in Ecuador. The plan was that Snowden would take the plane and leave Hong Kong for Russia, then from Russia to Cuba, and then from Cuba to Ecuador. There were no direct flights, but during this trip, when he arrived in Russia, the U.S. government canceled his passport, 
and here Snowden found himself stuck in Moscow airport. The airport officials did not allow him to take the plane because his passport was canceled. But at the same time, Russia refused the U.S. authorities' request to arrest Snowden due to the unstable political relationships between the two countries. Imagine Snowden staying in the airport hotel for 40 days. They did not know exactly what to do with him. But eventually, Russia decided to give him temporary political asylum for only one year. The consequences of Snowden's leaks were huge. Negotiations on the levels of governments and companies, parliamentary sessions in different countries around the world, security conferences and statements, and many investigations. Snowden's asylum was renewed, and he still lives in Russia to this day. Actually, a short time ago, in September last year, 2022, Putin, the Russian president, signed a decision to give Snowden the Russian citizenship that he had been waiting for since 2020 because of his wife's pregnancy. Snowden's lover, who was in America when he left, came to Russia, they got married, and they were expecting a child. That's why Snowden submitted a request for citizenship, which was given to him in 2022. And now that he has become a Russian citizen, he is no longer in any danger of being extradited to America. Even if the relationship between Russia and America improved, Russia wouldn't extradite a Russian citizen to America. The U.S. government still calls for Snowden's extradition so that he could be sentenced for the charges against him, and Snowden says that he is fine with going back, but on one condition. The government promises that his trial will be public. Of course, this condition is impossible to accept because it will cause more trouble. Many people, especially politicians in America, accuse Snowden of treason and espionage. Especially after he went to Russia, Snowden's response was always that he was not going to Russia. He was going to Ecuador. But the U.S. government was the one who canceled his passport in the middle of the trip, so he stayed in Russia. Snowden was always defending himself, saying that he left a comfortable life behind. His annual revenue reached more than $200,000. So, why would he betray his country? All he wanted to do was show the American citizens the reality of their government, their intelligence agencies, and the things that are happening behind the scenes, so that these citizens themselves can decide if this is the government they want or not. Snowden is now making a living through his media work, meaning he goes out on meetings, gives lectures, and goes out on documentaries. He also published a book in 2019 called Permanent Record, which was a diary of his own life. He documented all the events that happened to him, and millions of copies were sold. But imagine that the U.S. government sued Snowden and the publishing house to take the book's profits from them. Constitutionally, they don't have the right to prevent him from publishing the book. Because the first element in the U.S. Constitution guarantees freedom of expression of opinion, they attack the book in terms of profits and income. The main issue is that Snowden did not get a statement from the federal government to publish the book. Meaning, legally, any former employee in the intelligence agencies must ask for these agencies' permission before publishing any book. Since Snowden did not ask for it, the government has the right to issue the book's profits. Imagine that they issued about $5 million. Despite all this, Snowden lived comfortably in Russia. Of course, he would prefer to be in his country with his family, but at least his wife and son are with him. There are many people in this world, from the U.S. and other countries, who consider him a hero, and they consider what he did a great job. Not anyone can take this step that he took. He left his life and everything behind, and he does not go against his principles. Snowden today has 5.8 million followers on Twitter, but the funny thing is that he only follows one account, the account of the NSA. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Goodbye.